Suddenly, he's back in his trailer with his mother. He's laying back on the couch, nodding after snorting his pills. Nodding out after snorting his pills. His mother, on the other side of the trailer, is kneeling amongst the trash. She'd always been meticulously clean, emphasizing that while she might live in a trailer, they can still make it look nice. But over the past year, she's seemed to care less and less, and now, dishes were used and never cleaned, boxes of takeout opened and left where they were eaten. Cameron himself couldn't be bothered to tidy up. It's easier now that his mom doesn't give a fuck. He can do his drugs right in front of her now. The post-it notes and strips of fabric tied to every arch his mother spotted, even to things Cameron is pretty sure aren't arches, made the place look like a disaster anyway. It does bother him, though, as he watches her through half-lidded eyes. Or what does bother him is the way she looks. Her fur is disheveled and sticking up in different places, and she's in the same clothes she's been in for a week. She started to have a strange odor about her, but Cameron felt too weird telling his own mom she smells bad. It's sad. She almost wishes she'd scream at him and slap him like she did whenever she found his drugs. Almost. Because right now, he feels so good, and she seems happy enough to listen to that fan. Cameron covers his muzzle, heart pounding, listening to the whispering wind. No. No. His eyes blur with tears. He turns around, because he's worried someone might be watching him, and his feet scrape the gravel. Sadness seems to always... Cameron covers his ears, feeling the now familiar rising tide of panic in his chest. He's going crazy. Just like his mother, he's losing his mind. But his mother changed over the course of months. This is so sudden. He's never heard voices before. Or has he? That hallucination he'd had of Devon hanging. That was a voice. But that could have been a dream, too. Now Cameron's breathing is really starting to get out of control and he wants to run back to Devon and apologize, just so they can hold each other again. Of course Devon wouldn't fuck, him, uh, fuck with him over this, and Cameron can't understand why he thought that. It seemed like a possibility just five minutes ago. But something holds him from running back right now, and that's because if he's crazy, if he's crazy, he doesn't want Dev to see it. Sure, he'd had a few nervous breakdowns and panic attacks in the first few years of their relationship, but that's normal crazy. This... This is actually crazy. It's psychotic. And while Dev would hold it... And while Dev would hold him, comfort him, take him away from this place, who's to say what would happen after that? Behind his outgoing nature and warm smile, Dev would be doubting their relationship. He already is. He'd be worn down by Cameron's deteriorating mental state, his de deteriorating hygiene, the, te the, the deterioration of the man he once knew as the spiral into delusions deepens. Stop it. Stop. Stop it. I'm not mom. No, but you're her son. That voice, the one that comes from inside his head. The one that doesn't feel like his inner voice. The one that won't shut the fuck up. Cameron's walking back the way he came, back toward Devon, toward what he knows is real and safe. But is he? Yes. Even though he's scared, he says it confidently, and strangely enough, 
he feels what seems to be a pause on the voice's end. Like it's not quite sure how to respond. Good. Cameron thinks, this time with his own thoughts. He makes sure to walk to the side of the road, the dusty, somewhat rocky surface preferable to the whispering gravel. I'm so worried he's going to see Brian and run up to Brian excitedly. Uh, because they look similar. Because they're both big bears, yeah. Yeah, they're both brown bears. Devin keeps trying to figure out how things could have gone so wrong. His feelings earlier about an impending cat catastrophic failure now feeling validated. Yeah, everything's normal. Yeah. The graffiti is back to looking random instead of like a series of arches. All of the curves are The mountains are, gone. are not just little like loop, you know, upside down U's. Yeah. The, the can now has like a blurry monster logo instead of a, like a U shape. Yeah. His feelings are. I wonder how many people noticed notice that. that. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I think about what, like how you, when you talk about burning through visual novels, not really looking at the characters anymore. At some point, I'm like, that would just blow right past you. Oh, completely! I didn't even notice until you pointed it out. <laughs> yeah. I didn't notice the change happen. <laughs> like it took me a moment to realize, like, oh right, where's Devin's perspective? I should check to see if it's different. And then I looked up. Yeah, that's a good call. That it's Devin's perspective, or that it's um, it's Cameron's perspective that it's all tied to. So when we switch to Devin, it will be it would be back to normal. I would. I didn't even think. I honestly didn't notice it change back. Yeah. When? Yep. It's like all at once. Apparently, it was it. Yeah. Just now. Oh, that is subtle. They did it very yeah, slowly. Yeah, it fades over time. Yeah. <laughs> Devin keeps trying to figure out how things could have gone so wrong. His feelings earlier about an impending catastrophic failure now feeling fully validated. It's happened. He took those courses emphasizing ent engineering ethics. He studied cases in which every step of a disaster was detailed and exactly how each step was preventable. He took great care in his career to make sure he would never become one of those case studies, that the machines he helped design were as safe as possible. And while he'd already thought this, it's the fact he didn't even know Cameron was on an, an antipsychotic at some point, just that he was on meds. He knew Cameron's problems were concerning, and he reassured himself with a crash course in abnormal psychology. Psychology. While he was never as openly disdainful as his peers, the idea of trying to explain complex behavior through endless theories was frustrating, to say the least. That's just math, though. Like, that's literally what math is, is trying to explain complex, very, like, very deeply nuanced, like, mechanics of reality with, like, mathematics and physics and stuff. <laughs> that is what being a STEM major is. There's no difference. <laughs> There's just like a perception of objectivity because like the math is more final. Yeah, more final, exactly. And, and admittedly, the word theory is used in different contexts in these situations. Yep. He chalked it Absolutely. up to him being one of those people who simply needed a solid answer, a number. But he also remembers those months where Cameron was on his medication, how one night he'd had Dev sit with him in the arts building on campus. It was late. And no one was around as Cameron almost angrily bashed in the keys of the grand piano, asking him if any of it sounded good. Dev said it sounded fine. Then, the coyote finally broke down, saying he couldn't write music anymore. That emotionally, things had become black and white, that there was a wall between him and who he was, that the medicine he was taking was the reason why he fucked up his chance with the label. And as Cameron sobbed over the piano, Devin had decided that psychology didn't know a thing about how people work. That psychiatrists might as well be drug dealers with an office. It had been the same for his mother, after what happened with Lupita. Even now, she struggles with her addiction to benzodiazepines, 
something something carelessly prescribed to her so she'd stopped wailing all the time. To Devon, it seemed like psychology never moved past lobotomies. Instead, they just converted it into pills. Those are, and, that's not a good outlook, man. That's, I mean, that's obviously prejudice not. in its own right. He's he's already <laughs> he's already having his comeuppance and knows that at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and he never really changed that mindset. And it's why he never encouraged Cameron to seek some sort of help, especially if he didn't want it. What he took away from his research is that hallucinations of any kind are a serious concern and should never be brushed off. But he had done just that with the idea that maybe there's more to hallucinations for some people than psychology will ever understand. Maybe it's ghosts. Devin wants to hit himself. In fact, he wishes that Weasel Man had added a kick in, his, in the nuts to go with the gut punch, something else to remind him of how utterly stupid he is. The concept of the paranormal is so far from his mind at this point that he doubts he'll ever dabble in it again. See? There he is, dude. Devin looks up, and sure enough, he sees Cameron running towards him. The smile of relief on the coyote's face seems to break the dam of emotion in Dev's chest. That wild look he'd had earlier, the one that he had looked the one that had looked at him as if he were a stranger is gone. The next thing he knows, he's running too. He wonders why Cam is running on rough rocks and thorny vegetation, but Devin joins him, and Cameron runs into his chest with a thump. I'm sorry. I don't know what the hell I was... Stop. You're fine. That's all I care about. You're fine. But I don't know if I am. You are. You're here, and you're fine, and we're gonna go home, okay? Yeah. Careful. Devin, rocking them back and forth on the uneven, rocky ground, sends them to the dirt. But Devin just pulls Cameron into his lap, still hugging him tightly. Meanwhile, Artie is looking away seeming to have spotted something very interesting in the miniature forest just off the road, though he's smiling. I I'm sorry for bringing you here. I, I don't know what else to say, I'm just sorry. No, it's my fault for thinking I was special. That I had superpowers or something. None of this is your fault, okay? Cameron stays quiet, and Devin is content to just hold the coyote, both of them sniffling. Meanwhile, the coyote plucks at sagebrush that's rubbing up against them, which he holds to his nose. You know how I hate the desert. Devin tries to adjust to the jarring shift in conversation, but goes along with it, assuming Cameron just wants to focus on other things for now. I'm starting to hate it too, actually. Cameron inhales the sprig of sagebrush in his paw again. Well, I love the smell of sagebrush. The way the whole desert smells like it. Hmm. I suppose it's alright. There's something about it that reminds me of Christmas. That's weird coming from someone who grew up surrounded by pine forests. Like when we went up to my dad's cabin. Now that's the smell I can get behind. I guess I got too used to it, and sagebrush is just different. The desert version of pine forests. Pines can grow in the desert. Then I mean the ones in the northwest. We should go to your dad's cabin again. That was fun. Oh, really? I thought you didn't like it. In all honesty, Dev hadn't either. He had meant to take Cameron ice fishing, like his father had taken him so many times. The second they got there, though, he realized how woefully unprepared he was. I complain too much. We should go in the summer so we don't have to dig through four feet of snow just to open the cabin. Dev almost laughs at the memory 
of being so exhausted by the time he opened the cabin that his plans to romantically make love to Cameron went out the window the <laughs> second they got in bed. <laughs> yeah. I'll ask my dad about it when we get back. I just want to be somewhere with you. Away from this. Yeah. Far away from this. Dev, I don't think I'm actually psychic. I hallucinated a UFO a little bit ago. That's not real. Oh, uh, you just saw one? Well, in my mind, I was someone else. I saw a dead body and I saw a spacecraft in the sky. It didn't make sense. I see. Well, you won't have to worry about that anymore once we're out of here. I really, really hope we won't. Dev isn't going to ask him to elaborate or tell him that UFOs are commonly reported in Echo, especially in times where supernatural activity is at its peak. Yeah, don't you don't say that. Use your superpower. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. <laughs> Just keep that from him. Hide that yep. from him. <laughs> Never mention don't that. Don't let ever. him go on the conspiracy boards. <laughs> nope. Well, he wants to convince Cameron he isn't mentally ill. He knows that that's not what he should be doing right now. Also, he's mentally ill. <laughs> yeah, also he's really mentally ill, and you probably should kind of lean a little yeah. bit into that, because he doesn't seem to accept it yet. <laughs> like, even if he is psychic, he's also mentally ill. Yeah. Like, clearly, like, uh, Those extremely. things are not mutually exclusive in this universe. In, in no. fact, usually are paired to great detriment. Honestly, I'm still looking for characters that aren't mentally ill in this universe. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he wants to deny it, he doesn't know if it's true or not. He believes Cameron is psychic, but that's taken a back seat to the possibility that something else is happening too, and Dev can't be the one to figure out figure that out for Cameron. He can only be there to support him. Oh shit, I think Artie's in the forest. Yeah? Uh? Sure enough, Artie's disappeared. Oh, yeah, well, he'll be alright. We'll just call for him. Not really a big forest, anyway. Dev, that's where the shotgun guy is. Ah, fuck, I forgot. Dev stares at the tree line, hopefully. Dev, we have to get him. Well, he shouldn't be far in at all. Anyway, we can warn him real quick, but let's keep our voices down. They get up and move toward the forest. Dev wants to tell Cameron to wait on the road, but at the same time, he's worried about losing him again right after finding him. Just fucking Artie, goddammit. We, we need to walk the other way. What happened? Well, this is so nice. Yeah, it's it's so it's so peaceful. Think we about all not, the snakes in that grass. <laughs> we did we did not get to see <laughs> this the during the daytime before. Yeah. Somehow this seemingly innocuous patch of trees is even more ominous during the day. Artie. Dev whispers loudly into the trees, holding Cameron's paw as they descend into the ditch and over the forest side. They only take a few steps into the trees before Artie calls back. Yo, just taking a whiz. Figured you guys wouldn't want me staring. Dude, shut up. Dev continues to, sh to shout whisper. Uh, what's up? Devin can see movement from Artie now. Some of the bushes about ten feet ahead of them shifting. This is where that shotgun hick yelled at us. Oh, well, I'm almost done anyway. Dev sighs, then notices Cameron with his ears low, looking anxious. You all right, baby? Do you hear, like, radio static? It's really loud. Dev listens, but only hears some wind to the trees. I think it's just the leaves, honey. But then there is something. Maybe what could be described as static. Actually. Jesus. He jumps as his phone's notification sound goes off. Well, I definitely heard that. 
I do think it's just the wind, but I'm hearing it too. He takes his phone out, seeing that an email managed to get through. <laughs> Cottage in reservations. <laughs> Important booking information. Due to the ongoing public health emergency, all reservations have been cancelled. We sincerely apologize. <laughs> this periodic reminder of COVID. <laughs> yep, it's just a it's just a COVID jump scare. The, the greatest scare of them all. <laughs> actually about to become a very bad year to be able to hear the dead <laughs> oh no mm -hmm. he's walking and all of a sudden all he just he keeps hearing about hor horse dewormer <laughs> i don't believe in those vaccines says the recent ghost <laughs> he's he's walking Millions around outside times. and all of a sudden it's like and i i, I took a bunch of ivermectin seemed to work <laughs> for me those masks actually take more lives than they save <laughs> Just every bad argument in the form of recently deceased. Well, the notification banner cuts off there, and the surreal message makes Devin feel like they're isolated from the world now more than ever. He wonders if he should try to call the police, even though he still only has one bar. At this point, he'd be willing to let the authorities know that they're stranded before anything else can happen. Then something out of the corner of his eye catches his attention. It looks like the wall of a structure of some kind, beige and peeling, hard to see through all the leaves and branches. Devin holds up his paw in front of Cameron, signaling for him to stay put before taking a few cautious steps further into the forest. It's also just, just to note, just, just another another pee break in Echo Land. <laughs> another, Yet another, 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 peeing another piss break that drives the plot forward again. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks it's a trailer, one that looks so run down that he wouldn't be surprised if it's abandoned. What unsettles him is that it's buried so deep in the trees, it's like it's meant to be hidden. He can try to make a call further down the road, away from whatever that is. I'm here, I'm here. No need to t check on me. Okay, uh, let's go. I'm gonna try to make a call on the road, but we're going straight. The look on Artie's face makes the bear pause. What? What the fuck? His voice is quiet, but his tone is one of confusion and shock, staring over Dev's shoulder. Devin feels dread creep over him, not sure how something else could be happening right now, something so terrible that Artie has that look. Cameron stands where he left him. Oddly enough, he doesn't seem to be paying attention to them. He's staring up, towards the trees, and Devin can see his eyes darting from left to right. His ears are laying back and twitching, like he's hearing something that's too loud. His breathing is heavy, and Devin can see his chest heaving. He's panicking again, but the reason for it is clear. About a single second is all Dev has to see it, and to hear it. The fuck? That's great. And then it drops onto Cameron. What? Let's go! What the fuck? We're in Monster Town now. It's okay. full Silent Hill. Cameron is suffocating. Just moments ago, he's been he'd been gasping for breath, feeling the invisible dread c creep up his back, the deafening static growing in his ears. But now it's completely black. Something has its limbs around him, fingers over his mouth and nostrils. He thrashes around, or at least he tries to. He goes through the motions, but there's no sensation of movement. A straining inhale of air drones right next to his ear, the thing pressing its head against the side of his face. Cameron begs it to let go, tries to call for help. Devin was in front of him only seconds ago. Or minutes. The voice in his head returns. Or hours. Or 
Has it been years? It doesn't matter when you're dead. Cameron does think that he's died. And that he's in hell. Because of course he'd end up there. There is no de hell. There is death. This is what happens to everyone, Cameron. Cameron realizes then that it's not the thing holding on to him that's speaking to him. Because now is when it starts to speak. But it's not a voice he expects. No. Get away. A woman's voice. Stupid fucking cunt cheating whore. A man's voice. A, thicken a sickening thud. The tone of the static changes, and Cameron knows he's listening to something different. A different moment. He's dead. You can stop now. Nah, he's still twitching. And it continues. What sounds like someone screaming through a gag. A woman sobbing. A man begging. But then there's a shift. And though most of the voices were women, they became almost exclusively young men. If you let me go, I won't tell anyone I swear to God. No me mates, por favor. Stop! Stop! Just stop! And the voices blend together and go on and on and on. Meanwhile, Cameron goes limp, giving up, feeling as one with the voice that comes next. Why don't you just kill me? Devin watches as Cameron's body just goes limp, and though he tries to leap forward and catch him, the coyote slips to the ground at his feet. The bear instantly picks him up, or tries to. Though it's something he's done before many times, he'd never done it while Cameron was so completely lifeless, and he struggles with the coyote's dead weight. Cameron! Cameron! He lays the coyote out on his back. Hoping he just wakes up. What the fuck was that? Dude, what the hell was that thing? Whatever it was just seemed to absorb into Cameron, disappearing in an instant. Devin doesn't care. Two days ago, he would have thought he'd give almost anything to see something like that. Now it doesn't seem to matter at all. Cameron's, tr Cameron's chest that had been heaving seconds ago isn't moving at all now. Fuck. Fuck. Artie, he's not breathing, man. What do we do? Holy shit. Uh, maybe chest compressions, right? Right? The panic is threatening to overwhelm the bear, his peripheral vision dimming, going dark. And he has to rest a paw next to Cameron's head to steady himself. He can't pass out now. Otherwise, Cameron would only have Artie to help him, and the cat is seemingly frozen, his fingers twisting into his head fur. Why is this even happening? Why would he just stop breathing? Devin tries to tilt Cameron's, he Cameron's head back, straighten his torso so he can breathe. Come on. Come on. Breathe, Cam. Just breathe. Please. Devin rubs, rubs at Cameron's chest. It's such a desperate, useless gesture. Do you know how to do CPR? No. Devin readies himself, wishing he could remember a single useful thing from the one day he learned about CPR in high school. All he remembered was his tittering of his classmates about the female mannequin's chest and how they had to touch it. His vision blurs as he uselessly places his paws one over the other on Cameron's chest. And then a droning, ragged wheeze comes from the coyote's mouth. Oh my god, Cam? Another labored wheeze. He's breathing. He's breathing, right? That's right. Cam, keep going, baby. He is, 
but it's still strained. Like something heavy is on his chest. Not sure what else to do, Devin pulls Cameron into a sitting position, leaning the coyote against his body, and Cameron gasps. Oh, thank fucking god. Just keep breathing like that, honey. Yeah. Even Artie is crying, wiping his eyes as he laughs. But what just attacked him? You saw that thing, right? Or am I crazy? Devin shakes his head. I don't know what that was. I don't know. How Devin now Devin just needs Cameron to regain consciousness, so he knows he's okay for sure. Never had he seen evidence of or believed that the supernatural could physically harm the living. Let's get out of this forest, dude, in case it comes back. Yeah. Yeah, alright. He's very careful with how he moves Cameron, terrified that his breathing might stop again. But as he stands, cradling Cameron in his arms, he looks up. Standing twenty feet away, toward the trailer, is another bear. Mm. He's holding a shotgun. So it was him. Mm-hmm. Devin stares, feeling himself become oddly detached from the situation. His mind is still overwhelmed with what just happened to Cameron. That's what he wants to focus on, but the shotgun has his attention now, and for just a moment, Devin thinks about, thinks about just running. If he applies logic to the situation, he assumes the other bear won't shoot. But something in his eyes... Something is off. So Devin says what he hopes will make clear to this other bear that they're not a threat. We need help. Mm. We're stranded, and our friend is unconscious. The old-looking bear focuses on him for several seconds. Devin hears the rustling of dead leaves and foliage next to him as Arturo moves. Suddenly, the bear swings the shotgun around to point to Devin's right. Don't you move, boy. Hey, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, don't, don't shoot. Arturo sounds terrified, his voice strained and high-pitched. The old bear stares at Artie for several seconds before pointing the shotgun down toward the ground, but only slightly. The bear gestures at the coyote. You doing something to him? What? Doing something? No, we're trying to help him. Something attacked him. We need to get him help. The older bear grimaces. What do you mean, something? He hesitates, at least until the gun is shifted in his direction. No, wait. I'm not waiting. You show up to my property making all kinds of sounds, and you're standing there with a knocked out yote. Hey, we didn't do anything to him. We are trying to help. The bear growls. I don't care if you're trying to help him or trying to fuck him. I want to know the truth, not that something happened. The standoff continues for a few more seconds before Dev jumps in again. It was... Something dark, like a shadow. I, I called it something. I called it something because I didn't get a chance to see it, but it, it jumped on him and disappeared. Devin realizes what he's saying as he says it, and half expects to be shot for saying something so stupid. I, I swear to God, that's what happened. The old bear's eyes flick to Artie and the cat quickly, quickly throws his support behind the ridiculous statement. Yeah, that is what happened. I don't know what the fuck it was, but it was there. It was dark, and it had red eyes or some shit. I don't even think we should be out here right now. Devin, once again, wants to tell Artie to shut up. That saying more is only going to make the situation worse. But instead of getting angry again... An odd expression comes over the other bear's face, one that Devin can't quite decipher. Then he finally speaks, 
casually bringing the shotgun up to rest over his shoulder. And it jumped on him? That yote there? Yeah. Alrighty. So I'm guessing y'all are on some drugs or some shit. N no. Using out in the heat ain't ever a smart idea. Uh, we, we weren't... Devin trails off, realizing this doesn't sound... This doesn't matter at all right now. We need to get him help. He's not waking up. Devin kneels, resting Cameron on the ground as he half props him up, needing to rest his tired arms. There's a pause in which the other bear just stares down at him. A pause that's long enough that Dev opens his mouth to speak again. But that's finally when the older bear seems to break out of his trance. Shit! Of course! Sorry about the gun and all. It's just that I always get a bunch of coots on my property every now and then. Devin looks up in the, at the suddenly friendly bear. In the back of his mind, he thinks he can almost hear sirens. Very familiar sirens. Shit's not even loaded. The bear grunts as he brings the shotgun forward, pointing it back toward the ground before it seems to break in half as the shock suddenly drops down. Stock suddenly drops down. The bear turns to show them the barrels are empty. It actually does make Devin feel a bit better even if the gun had been pointed at them just minutes ago. The bear then closes it with a snap. So, I think your best bet is to call the proper authorities so they can get some help out here. Do you know how you can, we can do that? There's no service here. Of course there ain't, but there is service just outside of town, to the east. It works whenever I go out there to make a call. Dev's heart leaps in his chest at the idea that there might actually be a quick way out of the situation. This is a bizarre interaction with Brian. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I am honestly, this is the most dreadful thing that's happened in the entire game so far. I'm like so very tense about this because on one hand, the Brian could be trying to trick them and he's going to like clock them on the back of the head and, you know, tie them up and try to murder, kill them. Or we have to deal with the reality that Brian might be a helpful character for part of this game, and that's <laughs> equally fucked up and disturbing, and I don't like that at all. We've just legitimately never had anything resembling a normal conversation with Brian in any timeline. <laughs> so him just yeah. being like giving advice about where cell service is is just a fucking weird interaction. <laughs> Yeah, it's this so is genuinely bizarre. unsettling. It's so distressing. I'm so uncomfortable right now. It takes me right so now. off guard. <laughs> it's distressing because they have no idea to be worried beyond yeah. the obvious. Well, the thing is, is that they were worried and now he has disarmed himself. So they think they're in the clear. Yeah. And have now, now they're like, there's no reason to worry. But there's very much reason to worry. He looks in an eastward direction, ready to set off immediately. Hold on. It's a little ways out there. That's a pretty specific spot. I can give you a quick ride. No more than five minutes. Oh, it's bait. It's getting the yep. getting the car this candy. The candy is self is police. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh no. The old That's bear. not good candy either. No, 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 no. <laughs> The old bear turns away and starts making his way towards the trailer. Artie glances at him, clearly uneasy about all this. All your gut, man. Flee. Dev is hesitant himself, because of course he would be. Anyone would be. But after everything they've been through... Devin looks down at Cameron, the coyote still breathing steadily, now looking almost peaceful. Still, fear grips the bear's chest. The fact that Cameron still isn't waking up is slowly increasing his worry to the point of panic again. So he sets his jaw and follows the old bear. He half expects Artie not to follow, but he does, and the four of them disappear further into the trees. Don't do that. 
no 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 this is the worst choice they've made so far and they have the least reason to know that uh no don't it's just watching the train wreck about to happen it's just just the inevitability of it because like if brian had just showed up out of nowhere he'd be like oh brian's in the story weird but the fact yeah, that no, he's, it's, been, it's he's been building up to it yeah the fact that he's been built up twice now we're like oh fuck <laughs> brian's yeah. definitely in this story and brian's been in this story for five years after the end of echo so that yeah. he's been up to some shit 